I want you to meet him. Let's give a good welcome to Dr. Benny Beckham. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Norris. It's, it's good to be here. I enjoyed the, the Sunday school. And, uh, you know, I just enjoyed living. And, uh, but I have a question I need to ask you right off. I asked the Sunday school, so I might as well ask you too and the staff and everybody. Uh, have you talked to the Father today? Now, I'm not asking you if you have passed out a track or if, if you have read your Bible or, or if you thought about soul winning or, or any of that. Um, independent Baptist, fundamental Baptist, we, we, you know, we think about those kind of things. But let me ask you this again. Have you talked to the Father today? Have you communed with him? Let me call your attention uh, to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23. The Bible talks about a sin. You know, independent Baptists, boy, we, we really preach hard on sin, don't we? But this morning, I'm going to preach on a sin that for, I, I got saved when I was 16, and so I've been preaching 50 years I got saved on a Sunday morning, preached my first revival a week later, and so I've been preaching as long as I have been saved. And so, but all down through these years, I have never heard a message calling prayer a sin. Calling prayer a sin. Calling prayer a sin. I call it the greatest sin in the Bible. May I ask you to stand with me as we read the word of God. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23, the Bible says, not Brother Beckham, not some great preacher. I'll read a quote in a moment from a great preacher. But I want to read this from the Bible. The Bible says, God forbid, not Moses, not some great patriarch, not even the Apostle Paul, but God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Let's read that one more time. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Father, I love you. I thank you for this privilege, this honor to be able to stand in this pulpit where a great man stands week after week and proclaims your word. Father, I enjoyed Sunday school. It was such a blessing. Now, Father, I have the obligation again to preach your word, to share your heart, to share my heart. And, Lord, as I, have pr as I pray all the time, Lord, I want to love these folks. I want to be a blessing and an encouragement to them and to Dr. Norris and to the staff. Lord, I want to be very loving and compassionate and sensitive to their needs. And Lord, as I pray every night of my life, if I can't, if I can't, Lord, let me sit down and allow the pastor to come and do the preaching. I love you. And Lord, I pray that the sinner will listen to the voice of the Spirit this morning, and that they'll be born again. I pray that the Christian will listen, be honest with you about their prayer life. Thank you. I sure love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
The Bible talks about prayerlessness as a terrible, terrible sin. Dr. John R. Rice in his book, Prayer, Asking and Receiving, says this. Of itself, prayerlessness is, I have no doubt the great evangelist says, worse than murder, worse than adultery, worse than blasphemy. It is more fundamental. It more clearly reveals the heart. In fact, while murder and adultery and blasphemy may catch a person unaware, trapped by the carnal mind, prayerlessness is the very heart of the carnal mind itself. My greatest sins and yours is prayerlessness. My failures are all prayer failures. The lack of souls saved in my ministry is primarily because of the lack of prayer, not because of the lack of preaching. I say often that we can't even have a weenie roast without preaching, but we can have worship services, and we can go out soul winning, and we can preach the word without prayer. It is, it is a, a sad commentary in our, in our world today. And the great evangelist goes on. He said, the withering away of joy in my heart sometimes is the fruit of prayerlessness. My indecision, my lack of wisdom, my lack of guidance comes directly out of my prayerlessness. Number one, I want you to see this morning that prayerlessness is a sin of negligence. How many of you would say, Brother Beckham, prayer is good, prayer is right. Let me see your hands. Prayer is good, Brother Beckham, prayer is right. Oh, my. Let me quote a verse to you. Look in James chapter 4 and verse 17, because I know that you're thinking, but Brother Beckham, you said prayer is prayerlessness is the greatest sin in the Bible. I, I, I don't see where it's a sin. Well, let me show you. You just said that you know it's right. You know it's good. James says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is. It, to him, it is sin. So we must, we must this morning realize that prayerlessness is a terrible sin because as I was walking around this morning, you're a very friendly church, loving church. I feel like I have been here many times. And as I was walking around, some of you shared with me some of your burdens. And I thank you, and I will uh, pray for you if you'll give me your name I will pray for you. you. I'll guarantee you I will pray for that sickness and for that son or that grandson that may not be in church. Uh, but, but listen to me. It is very important as I was walking around and as I was hearing these, these terrible things, these prayer requests, and then I heard the preacher mention some more, and, and I, my mind went to prayerlessness. My mind went to James 4, 17. My mind is going to all the hands I just saw uh, that was raising and saying that prayer is good and that prayer is right. But see, if you're not doing it, if you're not doing it, if you're not doing it, then it is a sin. And if you're in sin, Psalm 66, 18 kicks in. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Not that he won't answer your prayer. He won't even hear your prayer if you are in sin. And so if you are committing this sin of prayerlessness, may I say to you, uh, even maybe right now, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, you may want to come to the altar. I don't know how you do things around here, but many times in my meetings, I have seen 100, 200 people at the altar during the preaching, getting things right as the Holy Spirit begins to move in their hearts. Andrew Murray wrote, wrote this, the sin of prayerlessness is a proof that the life of God in the soul is in deadly sickness and weakness. Our churches are weak. Our, church, our, our churches across America and Canada and foreign countries that I have visited are sick. And, uh, and, 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 and I see the hands. I, I hear the voices of people that say, I believe in prayer, but do you pray? Do you pray on a daily basis? Do you pray on, on a 24-hour deal? Someone asked me at West Coast last couple weeks ago, 
Uh, Brother Beckham, what is biblical prayer? What is biblical prayer? I say it. Biblical prayer is pray without ceasing. Pray everywhere. Don't faint. That's biblical prayer. It's not praying just because we hear the word cancer. It's not to pray just because a loved one dies or we lose our jobs and we go into financial woes. Oh, no. We are to pray every day. We are to pray every minute. We are to walk with the Lord all the time. That's biblical prayer. May I ask you, do you do that? Is that the type of prayer that you, are, that you know about this morning? So prayerlessness is a sin of negligence. Prayerlessness is a sin against our fellow man. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Two, the Bible declares that we are to pray for our leaders. I said to a group of preachers the other day, I said, listen, sirs, if we would quit cussing and complaining about our politicians and begin to pray for them, we may see a difference in America. Amen? If, we, if we'll just quit uh, complaining about them and begin to pray about, uh, pray for them and, and uh, pray for this country, I, I believe, I believe that we would see a great, great difference in America. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all. Now, some, some preacher, Dr. Norris, said to me the other day, uh, Brother Beckham, I want you to know, sir, that you put a lot of emphasis on first of all. But I want you to know, sir, I'm a, I'm a Greek I am, a, I am a Greek scholar, and, and you know, Brother Beckham, uh, I, 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 I see what, what the meaning of the Greek word, but, but, but Brother Beckham, it's really not significant. I said, what? What did you just say? You mean to tell me, sir, that, that this whole black book that I have been preaching for 50 years has insignificant words in it. So you are telling me it's no good? Are you telling, he said, oh, no, 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 don't jump to conclusions. I said, I'm not jumping to conclusions. I'm just taking what you just said. Let me report to you, Franklin Road Baptist Church, uh, there is no insignificant words in the Bible. They are all significant. Amen? And when the Bible says, First of all, that's what he means. The Bible says, first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Let me ask you, is prayer the first thing in your life? It was in the life of Christ. Uh, uh, it was the most important thing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you, uh, you can't be a good soul winner unless you have a good prayer life. You can't be a good preacher unless you have a good prayer life. You can't be a good Christian unless you have a good relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why the Apostle Paul wrote these significant words. First of all, first of all, prayer. First of all, prayer. And, and yes, I'm going to be dogmatic, Brother Norris. I'm going to be as dogmatic as I can because I believe the Bible is dogmatic on this doctrine, on this teaching of prayer. And then I want you to notice uh, in verse 2, for kings. Now, I know I'm in the south. I know where I'm at. I'm a Georgia boy. I'm a southern boy. I know where I'm at, but I'm going to say this. We, 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 don't have, we don't have a king. We have a president. And we may not like him, but I'll tell you what, you better like his position. You better pray for him. Why are we to pray for the president of the United States, whether it's President Obama or whether it's President-elect uh, uh, Trump, whoever he may be, the Bible tells us to pray for him. 
And, we, and that's the reason why Brother Beckham preaches this like I do. We are to pray for the president and the Senate and the Congress and the House of Representatives and all of those that are in authority. But my question to you as a church family and as my brothers and as my sisters, let me ask you, when was the last time that you prayed for those men that are in office? When was the last time you prayed for the law enforcement? agencies and I could go on and on and on and on see I don't know where we get off with this thinking that we can just pray whenever we feel the need but this is just as much of the word of God as going so winning as preaching the word as being separated from the world. This is just as important as those teachings are. But I'm not hearing it preached in our fundamental circles. I'm not hearing it taught in the Bible colleges of our fundamental movement. But let me tell you, it is, it is a very important teaching to the heart of God. Amen? Amen. And then I want you to notice something else. We are not only to pray, and we are not only to pray for, the, for our fellow man, but we are to pray for the unsaved. Would you look in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1? The Bible says, brethren, brethren, the apostle Paul talking, and he said, brethren, Christians, my heart desire." And prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Then I was reading the Lord's Prayer. No, not in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. But in John 17, the Lord's Prayer, the real Lord's Prayer, I hear my Lord Jesus talking and praying for those whom shall believe. Do you realize that he actually prayed for you? Jesus Christ actually prayed for you and for me to be born again. I got a hold of that in a motel room one, one night. My, my grandson was sitting there. He traveled with me for eight years. I homeschooled him. And Richard was on the bed uh, one afternoon right before church. And I was studying the Lord's Prayer. And oh my, I got down to that verse, and oh my, the Spirit spoke to my heart. And for the first time in my life, I saw that the Lord Jesus prayed for Benny Beckham. And before I knew it, Brother Norris, and I'm kind of uh, set back, and I'm kind of quiet, but I jumped up on that bed and I, I used it as a trampoline. I was jumping up and down. And my grandson looked at me and he said, Granddad, what in the world is wrong with you? I said, I just saw something that I have never seen in the word of God. Richard, let me tell you, Jesus Christ himself prayed that Granddad and you would be saved. He just kind of looked at me and said, oh. But I'll tell you, it was more than an O to me. It, it excited me. And, and so uh, Paul prayed for the lost. Jesus prayed for the lost. Do you pray for the lost? When was the last time that you have gotten on your knees agonizing to God to save a loved one. You know how we pray for lost people? We say, God, save Uncle Jack. Save Mama. Save Daddy. God, save my granddad. I prayed that prayer many times. And he died as a lost man. But where is the urgency in God, save my loved ones? Where is the urgency in that? You know what we should be what we should be praying? God. God. Oh my father. I have an uncle. Lord, you know him. You died for him. His name is Jack. Father, would you save Jack right now? Would you save him right this minute? 
See, if we really believe in hell, and if we really believe that when a man dies, lost, he busts his hell wide open, if we really believe that, we would pray agonizing, urgency prayers. Would we not? Would we not pray with urgency if we really believe that if Uncle Jack died, that one, the next moment that he's going to go to hell and that he's going to burn forever and forever and forever. If we really believe that in our fundamental circles, we wouldn't pray, God save Jack. We would pray, God save Jack right now. Save him right now. He's at home. He may be drinking a beer, but God save Jack right now. Where is the urgency? And then thirdly, we should pray for other believers. I, I go into uh, churches all the time, independent Baptist fundamental. I mean, churches that are, are well known and some, no one don't even know anything about them but God. But let me tell you, this side is fighting this side and this side is fighting this side and the church is fighting leadership and and I'm thinking father what what can we do and he said brother Benny preach prayer preach to the people to pray for one another see it's hard to talk about someone or gossip about someone or to be a tell barrier and pray for the same person and so if the church would get a hold of, <coughs> of this one thing, that we are to love one another, we are to forbear one another's uh, burdens, we are to be concerned with one another. But the most important thing that we can do for one another is to pray. Look with me in Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verse 17 and 19. The Apostle Paul is praying for the believers. And Paul prayed this prayer, one of many prayers. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to, <coughs> to the working of his mighty power. Franklin Road Baptist Church, when was the last time that you have prayed for a member, for a fellow sister, for a fellow brother? In this section, when was the last time you prayed for the pastor, for the deacon board, for the Sunday school, for the bus ministry, for all the outreaches that you may have here at the church? When was the last time that you have gotten on your knees at the altar or at home or on the job and just prayed, God, help Help sister so-and-so. Help brother so-and-so. This section, same questions. When was the last time that you got along with your father and just poured your heart out to him about your church? You have a great church. have a loving church. You have many missionaries. You're a soul-winning church. But I'm asking you this morning, are you, I heard the pastor say that you're a praying church, but are you a praying individual? Do you pray? Do you have your closet time? Do you have your restricted time? Do you have the time that you personally get along with God himself and just talk to him about all these things that Brother Beckham has mentioned this morning? You say, sir, I'm listening. But what if, what if I just decide I'm, this prayer thing is just not for me? Oh, I'll pray with my church, and I'll come on Wednesday night, and I'll, I'll do that. But nothing, nothing extraordinary, Brother Beckham. What if I just kind of overlook this message? Well, can I just share with you a few more things? Listen to me. 
you're going to be in trouble. Because see, John Bunyan put it this way. Prayer will make a man cease from sin, as sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. See, what's going to happen is this sin of prayerlessness is, is going to rob you of your joy. Have you, have you experienced more joyful days in your Christian walk? Can you think about a day that you were more joyful than you are this morning? I got good news for you. You can, God is faithful and just forgive you. And if you'll come to him and ask him to forgive you of your prayerlessness, guess what? He'll restore your joy just like he did to David. David said it like this. He said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Listen, brothers and sisters, I love you. But I don't love you like Jesus loves you. And he, wa- he doesn't want you to walk around sad. He doesn't want you to walk around backslidden. He doesn't want you to walk around defeated. He wants you to be victorious. And the only way that you can be victorious is to have this prayer relationship with the Lord. And that joy will be there. Every, if, you, if you biblically pray without ceasing and pray everywhere and don't faint, I'll tell you, You'll be a joyful person. You'll have a joy in your heart. Do you believe that? How many of you believe that? And then number two, not only will you lose your joy, but you'll lose your peace. I go into churches, and, and I see Tom sitting on the front row, and uh, boy, he, he's, he's, he's happy. And boy, he's got the peace of God ruling in his heart. I go back the next year. Tom's about halfway. I go back the third year. Tom's all the way back on the back row. I go back the fourth year. I don't see Tom at all. You know why? Because that prayerlessness took his joy away. Then it took the peace away. And Then old Tom just said, what the use? And he walked out the back door. I say to the pastor, can, can we go and see old brother Tom? I would like to talk to him. Yeah, brother Beckham, if he'll let us in, knock on that door. Tom comes to the door, no more smiling, no peace. I say, hey, Tom, I'm in town. I'm at the church, I'm missing you. I know, preacher. Can I come in? No, not today, preacher. Have a good day, preacher. And he shuts the door. Breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. But I see it all over America. Go to Canada, see the same thing. People has lost their joy and peace. Then they lose the blessings. They lose the blessings of God. Dr. Norris, I, I love to be blessed. Boy. Church, how many of you like to be blessed? Listen, you can't be blessed and have this sin of prayerlessness in your life. One more question. And let us stand. And we'll go into the invitation. But let me ask you this. Is the sin of prayerlessness robbing you of those three things? I know your own staff, guys, but just because your own staff, just because you're a pastor, just because I'm an evangelist, that doesn't, and, and, and we are busy. I'm busy. I'm writing articles for magazines. I'm, I'm soul winning. I'm, I'm preaching every night of my life. I'm writing books. I'm running a ministry. I'm busy. But church, that doesn't make me spiritual. 
That doesn't make Brother Beckham spiritual. What makes me spiritual is this prayer life, this relationship that I have with my father. So you may be busy. You may be out on soul winning every, every night of the week. You may be out on the bus routes. But if you're not talking to the Father, you're in sin. And he's faithful. I said so in the, in the message. He's faithful and just to forgive you. So do we have a song, preacher? Okay. We're going to have a song. And as our musicians begins to, to play, I want you as a church to be honest with God this morning. And let's just get around the altar and see and just talk to God. Would you do that this morning? Would you do that? All over the auditorium, people are coming from the balcony. I'll remind you of something. Have you prayed for the lost? You may want to come this morning, get around the altar and pray for your lost loved ones. You may want to come this morning and pray for Dr. Norris, his family. You may want to come this morning and pray for the, for the deacon board, for the Sunday school, for the bus ministry, for the Spanish church. And I could go on and on. How about it? Folks are praying. The sin of prayerlessness. Just a very practical, very simple message, but oh my, don't take away the importance of it. How about it? <coughs> you may say, Brother Beckham, I know you preached on prayer, but see, sir, I'm a. I, I'm lost. I need to be saved. There's staff down in the front. And would you come and let someone take a Bible and open it and show you how to be saved this morning and uh, pray with you? Would you do that? Folks are... Here's a question I always ask. Have you been honest with yourself and with God this morning? I had to be honest. It was almost 20 years ago when Miss Beckham was dying with cancer. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart about my prayerlessness. And I may share more about that tonight, but I remember the day, Dr. Norris, I was honest with God about my sin of prayerlessness. Because Diane was already dying before we even knew she was dying. And I realized I couldn't even pray. love you church but the God I'm talking about loves you even more think about prayer today see it lives inside of you everywhere you go he goes with you we wouldn't walk with our worst friend and not talk to him but we walk with the Lord all day very seldom do we just talk to him all day long. And thank you for listening. I hope that you
we'll heed to the words that you heard this morning. Thank you. Love you.